morning. Welcome, especially to our guests and visitors today. This is the uh, last uh, Sunday before the season of Lent picks up. Our uh, quinquagesima, or about 50 days till Easter, uh, we, uh, is the name of the Sunday. And the order of service we'll be following is divine service setting four. It's on page 23, but of course on the bulletins it is completely printed out along with the hymns. Uh, besides uh, the prayers that are listed, a couple of additions. A friend of mine from college, Ted Kahn, I heard that he had a major heart attack last week um, and triple bypass. And right now he's in intensive care with liver issues, which is uh, difficult. So pray for him. Also, our congregational president, Ed Martinson, I heard that he has uh, cellulitis and some blood sugar issues. So I'll add him to the prayers today as well. And our foster baby Zechariah, still hospitalized on Minneapolis, kind of a up and down, um, still uh, hopeful that he'll be able to come home soon. Um, so that's, uh, we'll keep him in our prayers as well. And I think that's about it for pre-service announcements. The opening hymn, Amazing Grace, 744. We prepare our hearts for worship and rise as we sing again. Thank mm -hmm.
name of the Lord, who made, who made heaven and earth. earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? If you bear forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We kneel. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
having set us free from the bonds of our sins, deliver us from every evil. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Quinquagesima is from 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is Psalm 89, beginning with verse 18. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel.
The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul writes these beautiful words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I, give, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Rise to the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Taking the twelve, Jesus said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, praise to you, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. May be seated for the hymn of the day, 849.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for meditation, well, I'm going to preach on all, mention all three of the readings, but I'll begin with the Old Testament reading, and I want to read three of those verses. Uh, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. The Lord said to Samuel, then later, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It's our text. You may be seated. Dear Christian friends, this, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, this day is called Quinquagesima, signifying about the 50th day until our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the whole church here focuses on, on Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. That is our salvation. This is the last of the Sundays between Epiphany and Lent. And the underlying theme for this day as the uh, lectionary summary on page 2 of the bulletin pointed out, the underlying theme is faith. And faith is a matter of the heart. You can't see faith, but it is vital, essential in fact. We must have faith, but it's not just any faith. We must have faith also rightly placed. Faith needs to be trusting and holding on to the right person. It needs to be holding on to Jesus. And even when I preach on texts that are not the gospel, the gospel is always setting the theme for the day. And today we have from Luke 18. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. And why? Well, he tells his disciples very clearly and openly. He is going to suffer and die and rise. But his disciples did not understand. They were, you might say, blind to Jesus' purpose. On the other hand, we have this blind man on the road, which Mark gives his name, Bartimaeus. The blind man is able to see, maybe even better than the others, who Jesus really is. He is told that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and yet he calls out twice Jesus and calls him Son of David. Have mercy on me, son of David. You see, that was a messianic term. He's expressing faith in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the anointed one, the one that God had promised repeatedly since the fall into sin, and finally, at just the right time, sent by God into the world. And one of the key prophecies was that the Messiah would be a descendant of David which seems to be why this particular passage was chosen as the Old Testament reading for this day, describing how and why David himself was chosen by God and anointed as king over Israel. The Old Testament reading begins with Saul being grieved over, or with Samuel being grieved over Saul. Samuel had anointed Saul as king. He had been chosen by God to be king, but it turned out to be ultimately a failure, a disappointment to Samuel and all godly people. He had not been obedient to God's commands and when confronted over his sins, and this is particularly Saul's issue, I mean, when he was confronted by, God, confronted by Samuel over his sin, he refused to repent. He tried to excuse himself. He made reasons why he did what he did instead of simply acknowledging his wrong and confessing and being forgiven. He started out humble. In fact, humility was one of the defining characteristics of Saul at first. But when raised to his position as king, he rapidly became proud and arrogant. And later, when David began gaining notoriety, Saul was jealous and even tried to kill him. Saul is a, a clear warning to many of us. Saul was chosen by God for a purpose, to serve as king. Saul ended up being, though, rejected by God, rejected because of his sin and lack of repentance. Saul's lack of humility is how we all too often are tempted to take pride in ourselves instead of what God wants to do in and through us. His failure to serve as the king that God intended him to be reminds us of how we so often fail to do as God 
instructs us. His lack of repentance reminds us how apart from the work of Christ in us, and repentance is indeed a work of God in us, we too often don't want to admit that we are wrong and in need of help. Samuel was getting on in years and saw this happen against in Saul and was grieved. He mourned over Saul's rejection of God and his ways and, and, uh, and uh, other people besides the king as well. And Samuel decided to change his focus. He wanted to leave his, his task as judge over the people instead focus on the training of the prophets, known as called later the company of the prophets. But God told Samuel of another plan. God had another purpose for Samuel, and instead of simply mourning over Saul's unrepentance, God told Samuel to end his mourning and to go and do what God had in mind for Samuel to do. God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse of Bethlehem, among whose sons God had chosen a new king. You know, this wasn't open knowledge, at least at first. Jesse didn't know what this was about. Samuel had said that he came to offer a sacrifice to the Lord, and indeed he had. He had come to give that sacrifice, but part of Samuel's task, and really the most important task being sent by God to do here, was to anoint a new king, a substitute for Saul. And this new king would ultimately be the king who, in God's purpose, would serve as the ancestor to the true and eternal king, the coming king. Christ our Lord, the Savior, who himself would be the substitute, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. David became the ancestor of Jesus according to the flesh, and in many ways, also a picture and a type of who Jesus would be. Like Jesus is a good shepherd. David was a shepherd uh, caring for the sheep. Uh, David was a godly king. I mean, these, these are different ways in which David was a picture of Christ who were to come. Samuel, of course, was sent to Jesse and looked at his sons, and the first, the oldest son, Samuel's impression was, well, this has got to be the one that God chose. He was a fine man, a godly man, according to outward appearances. But that's where God spoke to Samuel the words which we know so well, and which I read to you again. The Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. This is a truth we should impress upon ourselves. And the heart is a location of faith. In fact, we can even see a connection with those words in our gospel reading. The connection between seeing and not seeing. The disciples couldn't see. The blind man could see. God sees reality in a different way. God looks at the heart. And he saw in David a different heart. Elsewhere, God spoke of David as a man after his own heart. In David, God had worked such that his sinful heart of stone had been replaced with a heart of flesh. For Saul, it was the opposite. And David, even though he did sin in many obvious and dramatic ways, I mean, the, the difference was that David, when confronted, repented, and return to the Lord. One of the benefits this year of having a later Easter is that in the daily readings, which I've been going along the, the New Testament reading from the Gospel of John, we've been getting more of that Gospel of John before switching to the appointed readings for the days of Lent. And if you were reading along this past week, you read that beautiful passage from John chapter 8, the account of the woman caught in adultery. The scribes and Pharisees tried to trap Jesus by bringing to him a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And since the law commanded people caught in adultery to be stoned, they wanted to know what Jesus would advise in this situation. Like so often, their, their interactions with Jesus were meant to be a trap. They were, And the trap here is, of course, that Jesus would either demonstrate a lack of mercy and love and suggest that she be put to death or advise against the following of the law of Moses. And in either case, of course, if Jesus had answered in either one of those ways, they would have something to use against Jesus because they were opposed to him. 
But Jesus, as in the other traps that were often laid out for him, he knew the right way out. And Jesus' response was this, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. Of course, Jesus did not uh, condone breaking the law, but he also showed mercy and the ability for God to work a changed heart. And when the accusers went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones, Jesus was finally able to address the woman, Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Then neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus was, of course, the sinless one, the one who could have thrown a stone against her according to the words that Jesus had spoken. But he did not, because Jesus' purpose was not to condemn sinners, but to save them. Our psalm this day is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 89, and one ver uh, some of those verses are these. Of old you spoke a vision to your godly ones and said, and then the words of God, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm shall also strengthen him. Now this is not about the first King David. I mean, we know that because the psalm was written later. But it is about the son of David. It is about Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was the son of David, but also the son of God. Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, the one who had come to do the task that the Father gave to him, strengthened by him. Jesus Christ is the true David, the one who took our place, who went to the cross, and because of whom we are saved. When we cry out to him in our need, whatever our need, and he invites us to do this. He says, bring your prayers before me. Like Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus' response to us is similar to his response to Bartimaeus, your faith has saved you. The faith that God works in our hearts changes us. It changes our hearts and it changes us. You've seen that those themes coming together, it might seem at first a bit strange to hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 as our epistle. And sometimes I do preach on that text. I hope when I do, I usually tie it in with the other readings because it is a great text and it shows what true love is. John mentions in his letters that, that God is love. Love is defined by God and is exhibited by God, and without Jesus showing us that love, we would not know what love truly is. Love is Jesus giving himself up for us. It is Jesus knowing what was coming for him and yet setting his face to Jerusalem, going there willingly in order to save us, knowing that it meant suffering and death for himself, but also that he would rise again. And he was preparing his disciples for what would happen as he spoke to them over and over, predicting what would come. Jesus was on a journey, a journey to the cross. That was his purpose. And of course, heading into the season of Lent, as we are now this coming Wednesday, we follow Jesus along that path, watching as we do each year, as Jesus goes to Jerusalem, as he goes to the cross to save us. We pray that God will be with us and give us eyes to see not only what happens to Jesus, but why and how that work is done and how Jesus' work brings about that change in us, the change of our hearts of stone to a heart of flesh, a heart that believes, a heart on which the Spirit of God has worked and continues to work as he brings us from this earthly kingdom, or from this earthly kingdom to himself and ultimately in eternity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And may the peace of God which passes all our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We continue with the prayers. to see and the ears of the deaf to hear. As we prepare to enter the season of Lent, open our eyes and ears anew 
the preaching of your law and gospel, to see and hear your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Preserve your church and her ministers. Give to all pastors courage to embrace God, embrace gladly the crosses of their office, and following the example of all, all Christians, may also bear the reproach of the world, the attacks of Satan, and the temptations of the flesh in confidence of Christ's redemption. Be with those who are preparing to serve your church and proclaim that word, including Jacob Frank and Joseph Minch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the family and all godly Christian homes. Give parents diligence and persistence in their duties to teach the faith in word and example. Keep all children in the promise that you made to them in their baptism. Let the patience, kindness, and endurance of Christian love have no end among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve the state and all its servants. To all whom you have given authority, bestow also the wisdom needed to use it dutifully for the benefit of those under that authority. Be with our military men and women, including Mike Carl, Abigail Frank, Matt Hanula, Eric Jazerski, John Jazerski, Eric Johnson, David Polzine, and Nick Polzine. And be with the people of Ukraine facing invasion and war. Lord, in your mercy, preserve us and all who call to you in any need, especially those who have requested our prayers. Ted Kahn, Ed Martinson, Jane Antonson, Joanne Woolman, Drew Chambers, Doug Chambers, Chris Irvin, Matthew Gibson, Bill Coivisto, Tim Jazerski, Pat Johnson, Teresa Coivola, Sylvia Linder, Lois Maine, Eileen McKenzie, Diana Miller, Delilah Olson, Julie Reinemann, Wyatt Robinson, Ray and Virginia Rodewald, Dagmar Siebold, Dave Sorensen, Holly Soroman, Dorothy Thorson, Zechariah Ailman, Tim Wendy and Ashley Beard, Doug, Nancy Egbert, John Glendenning, Lou Johnson, Carrie Jones, Greg and Marla Maddock, Deborah McKeever, Robin Minch, Thomas Murphy, Carl Norman, Doug Pariso, Ramona Sanders, Jeff Stevenson, Adeline Silliman, Alan Sorensen, Dan Spielman, Wally Srock, Jihan Udall, Margie Weber, and Elizabeth Zubar. And women expecting children, including Tessa Minch. Lord, in your mercy. Here I pray. Preserve your holy communion and your son's blessed supper among us. Give contrition and faith to those who gather at this altar. Unite them in their confession of your truth. And so bring them worthily to eat and to drink Christ's body and blood for their forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy. Here I pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, what you foretold to the holy prophets has been fulfilled and accomplished in the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son. You have set forth his passion and resurrection as a firm foundation and content for our faith. Have mercy on us and open our eyes to be fixed on the Son of David at all times. Give us courage to follow him through all adversity and every assault of the devil, to view his passion with repentant hearts and with delight, for you have redeemed us all from all sin and evil. Comfort us with the certainty of Christ's resurrection, by which we, too, have the confidence of eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May be seated for the offering. Please, if you've not done so already, take the blue fellowship pads from the center aisle side of each pew and fill those out, pass them to the outside, and return them back to the center.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and say,
Body and blood. 